it's my great honor and pleasure that we can welcome here Professor Beatrice Colomina from Princeton University. I would like to thank her for coming to Prague on behalf of the Institute of Art History, not only history, but Art History of Academic Sciences, and also on behalf of the uh, Gallery of uh, Jaroslav Ragner. Uh, as you may know, we, that means uh, uh, our institute in the academy, together with other institutes of academy, are, uh, we work on the project, research project, uh, public and private, and this, as the theme of the multidisciplinary research. And at the same time, Gallery uh, prepared the exhibition on public space. I was one of the curators. So there is no wonder that we have decided to invite uh, Professor Colomina to Prague uh, with a lecture which is part of our research program as well as part of the accompanying program of the, of the exhibition. Uh, Professor Colomina, uh, and that, is, that was the first reason, was, as I know, uh, famous for the first time uh, with her book, which and the theme and the title is Privacy and Publicity, Modern Architecture as Mass Media. And she followed the theme of media, of the relation between media and architecture also through during her uh, father career and father uh, books, we met then a speaker sent Bauhaus column, uh, colloque, and the title of the colloque was uh, Architectur Medium, that means uh, architecture as medium, and so on. And uh, the last uh, work of uh, Beatrice was uh, prepared uh, preparation of the Biennale in Istanbul, together with her husband, Professor Mark Wigley, and we have the pleasure to welcome here also Professor Wigley from Columbia University, my alma mater at a little bit, <laughs> for <Four> months. <laughs> so uh, the last uh, joint book, is, the name is Are We Human? And of course, also here you find uh, chapters which deal with the same media, architecture, and so on. Uh, as I remember the uh, colloquy in Bauhaus in Weimar, that it had a motto taken from uh, Victor Hugo book, uh, uh, the book will kill building, the book will kill architecture, that means it will take over the, the message, the, the meanings which were earlier uh, connected with, with buildings and architecture. Since the time, the media developed, and then came uh, journals and radio and TV, and now the most important are social media. And uh, again, the, the, the important questions are, what is the relation to architecture, how they influence not only architecture, but also how we perceive or how we understand the world, each uh, ourselves in the world which is dominated by social media. And I think we will uh, hear very much about it in the lecture, so I will not misuse the time, and I invite Beatrice, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for your incredibly uh, uh, generous uh, introduction. And for inviting uh, me to come to Prague, you cannot believe how happy I am to be here and how grateful I am to uh, your generosity, uh, taking me around to see all these wonderful uh, things in, in the city. So thank you very much, uh, Peter uh, Kratzotville and Rusila Svaha for taking me to see uh, Cubist, uh, uh, Czech Cubism, or, and uh, Villa Muller, of course, which I have inhabited in my dreams and in, uh, through the photographs for so long, but uh, I have never been inside until uh, uh, this morning, and it was for me, of course, an incredibly uh, moving uh, experience. Uh, it's interesting that Peter brought the um, book, Privacy and Publicity, because in many ways uh, what I'm about to uh, present uh, here uh, uh, goes back to, to this moment and updates it to, update, update it to 
uh, sorry, this just stop, uh, for the uh, 21st century. Because when I wrote about uh, privacy and publicity, uh, we didn't have, of course, uh, internet, uh, we didn't have email, we didn't have <laughs> social media, we didn't have anything. The most advanced technology uh, that we have at home, uh, and it was completely uh, new, was the fax machine that used to wake up in the middle of the night with the ring of the telephone and then the crack, 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 the paper. And then we felt so um, incredibly connected to the world. All of a sudden, we didn't have to run uh, the night uh, before or two days before to the FedEx uh, office. Um, to give a paper that was going to be published in a magazine and the deadline. I mean, all this nightmare ended up. So uh, then uh, we are in this incredible moment in which media, new media, is transforming our lives in such an incredible way. And perhaps uh, the most important, actually, um, transformation in the... Is, it, is the sound OK? Or is too, 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 it's clear or is too much? No? It's OK. Um, Perhaps the most, uh, precisely the most important uh, transformation in the social, cultural, and econo economic uh, life in the 21st uh, century has been the arrival of uh, social media. And with it, actually, a new space for design uh, open up. Indeed, uh, social media is actually the ultimate space uh, uh, for design. Yeah, it's not working, I knew. Right. Okay, um, whoop. Uh, so uh, between the fact that I have to uh, more or less follow a script because otherwise uh, the translation, the translator uh, will have difficulty and this thing here, I don't know how can I improvise very much, but uh, I was saying that uh, I think that uh, the most important transformation in the social, cultural and economic life in the 21st century has been the arrival of social media and this is social media in China, of course, and we see a new space for design has opened up. Indeed, social media is the ultimate space for, the spa, for design, a space uh, where design uh, happens uh, really uh, uh, fast and by an unprecedented number of people. Through its multiple channels, we not only uh, communicate uh, and collaborate with wider and wider groups, but we refashion ourselves. Images, videos, tests, emojis, stickers, tweets, GIFs, memes, comments, posts, and reposts are deployed to construct a very precise image that doesn't necessarily match a real life person, a kind of avatar, uh, launched uh, with seemingly independent thoughts, looks, and actions, a perfected self, perhaps, the image of who we would like to be uh, that becomes real online. And of course, there is no limit to how many digital personalities we might uh, maintain at the same time, including anonymous. Here, for example, it's a template of different social uh, media sites waiting for you to construct a, a profile. Who I am going uh, to be, a version of myself that will be experienced by m more people than my physical uh, self, and it will become real, the real me. A whole new population arrives, an interactive community, if you want, that lives together digitally, eats together, argues, invents, entertains, soothes, annoys, violates, etc. Well, the striking thing for uh, those of you that are too young to remember is that there was actually no social media at all before the year uh, 2000. So I'm going to give you a very short history of social media, which is very surprising. Friends Reunite, Reunite uh, was actually launched in the UK uh, in the year 2000 to help people locate all school uh, friends. There was uh, actually the first successful online social uh, network, and by the end of the year, it had 3,000 users. That was considered success, right? Many other attempts have happened before. This gets to 3,000, and a year later, it had 2.5 million users, and then with them, uh, uh, social media as we know it today was launched. Um, in uh, 2002, Friendster uh, got 3 million in just uh, three months, 
2003 uh, was the year of MySpace. Many of you will remember MySpace. In 2004, everybody knows uh, Facebook. It started at Harvard as a college uh, version of Friendster. They were copying Friendster, actually. In between a month, half of the Harvard uh, population was on it, and soon, soon it expanded to other colleges. And in 2005, uh, Facebook opened to high school uh, students. 2005 was also the year in which YouTube was launched with an invitation to broadcast yourself, in case you had missed what this was all about. Right? The year uh, 2006 was uh, uh, the year of um, Twitter, as well as the year uh, in which Facebook opened to anybody above 13 years old. Uh, WhatsApp uh, arrived um, in 2009 and is the most uh, globally popular messaging uh, app with 1.3 billion uh, 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 users. Kakao Talk, I mean, the whole thing about social media in Asia is super interesting, but we don't have a lot of time to go into it. Everybody in uh, Korea is in uh, Kakao uh, Talk. Uh, it was launched in 2010. When I say uh, everybody, is 93% of the smartphone users are on Kakao Talk. You are in Korea, and grandmothers are on Kakao Talk. You can buy things on Kakao. You go to a coffee place and you buy with your Kakao Talk. You have to identify with one of these uh, characters. You are <laughs> Kakao friends, etc. So I mean, the whole thing about social media in Asia is really something else because, in fact, uh, um, we follow uh, them. They are much more uh, innovative. Instagram, of course, everybody knows. Uh, Instagram was launched in uh, October of 2010 and had 3,000 users uh, as of December of 2014 and 800 million uh, now. It's one of the social networks that has uh, risen more rapidly uh, uh, in popularity. 53% of the 18 to 29 years old use it, and only 26% uh, of users are older than 29. So it's really a down uh, uh, up. It's, more, it's considered more urban, and that's interesting that it's considered more urban. They want more use by women, by Latinos, by African Americans, and by designers too. So for, uh, for once, we are on the cool side of uh, things. Um, LINE is a messaging service for um, uh, in Japan. It was launched in 2011 and it's also extremely popular in Korea. It's very interesting. It has all these bigger stickers and a lot of uh, uh, very different things. Uh, it has uh, 7 million users uh, worldwide. What is interesting, I think, about LINE is it was designed by 15 members of the what is called the New Human Network. Uh, that was um, uh, made in response to Japan's uh, devastating uh, Tohoku earthquake in March of 2011, which damaged tele all the telecommunication infrastructure. So um, this uh, social media was uh, actually uh, very innovative in uh, dealing with the problem of the uh, collapse of the uh, traditional infrastructure. Well, this short history, of course, could continue on and on. In China, as you know, it's incredible as well. Uh, there has been, in any case, an exponential acceleration of the number of available uh, channels for broadcasting uh, of the cell, much my uh, accelerating number of people using them. There are social networks for practically everything. To find work, uh, there is uh, LinkedIn. Uh, there are location-based uh, dating apps like uh, Tinder or Grindr. Um, uh, there are uh, videos like Vimeo and YouTube. Uh, there are mold boards like Tumblr or uh, Pinterest and so many others. Perhaps the network that has risen uh, more rapidly in popularity among young people uh, recently has been Snapchat, where users uh, actually program how long, as you know very well, how long their photos or videos will be visible to others. Uh, and this is between one and ten uh, seconds. So, and then presumably they are permanently erased from the system. What is interesting to me here is that in a few seconds has become a new space uh, for uh, design. Uh, the uh, demographics of it all are also super uh, interesting. 
This is actually quite old, it's from 2014, but you already see in 2014 the young people are um, uh, uh, actually abandoning Facebook, that's something that their parents do. So only 19% in 2004 of the people between 18 and 24 on Facebook, and 45% are in Snapchat, that's 2014. Now actually Facebook has become like uh, the social media for older people, and uh, uh, Snapchat is of course much more popular, but this changes all the time. Now some people, young people in Snapchat feel that their parents are already in Snapchat and is the end of, uh, of it. Um, in any case, um, this is a, actually a map of, um, of Facebook users uh, in the year uh, 2010 that showed that there were 700 active users. They were, it's a very proud moment. There are now more than 2 billion uh, people on uh, Facebook. Facebook and it is estimated that 4 billion people, that's 60% of the world population, are already connected to the internet, with 70% of them engaged in some form of social media, mainly through their uh, cell phones. And don't even think for one minute that this is a first world uh, problem versus a third world problem, whatever these terms uh, uh, mean. Here is a Maasai uh, farmer in Kenya, and he's checking the prices uh, in the market to see whether it's worth for him to go to the market on, on, uh, on that day. Uh, and here are some uh, refugees arriving in the uh, island of uh, Lebos. Uh, first, thing they want to do is, uh, and this is something that I saw in interviews uh, with refugees already like three years ago before the big uh, crisis, first thing they need to do, and they don't say, oh, I need to eat, or I need a place to sleep, or I need uh, something else, I need to connect my, my, my cell phone. So the cell phone is their lifeline, the way in which they are going to connect with um, other people. Uh, here is this uh, very beautiful uh, image in the glow, the blue glow uh, of, the, of the cell phone uh, right, uh, recently arrived and they are already trying to connect with those that they left behind but also with those that are ahead of them and they are going to tell them no, don't go through this path because you will encounter uh, such and such problems so, so is, the, uh, is there also their uh, uh, photographic albums of their families, their memories, is their connection to... The, so in, in a way, it's a new form of shelter. The cell phone, the cell phone as an emergency, uh, but also as a kind of uh, shelter in this, uh, in this kind of uh, war. Um, this, of course, represents a, a complete uh, transformation of, of the way in which we live, which has huge implications for architecture and design. Social media is not simply what happens in the uh, space of digital uh, space. space. Um, social media uh, uh, constructs a new kind of uh, virtual city that has taken over many of the functions of the traditional city. We now, in fact, inhabit a kind of hybrid space between virtual and real. You could, you could ask yourself, for example, where are these people? I mean, if you pay a little bit of attention, you will see that perhaps they are waiting for a metro somewhere, uh, perhaps in Asia. But at the same time, they are in another space. Uh, they are all uh, looking at this uh, little screen. They are connecting with uh, other people in other places. So this is our condition today. I'm sure that many of you are in here in this lecture and also checking uh, what's happening uh, through social media or sending posts or uh, uh, pictures or, or, or whatever it is. So social media redefines and restructures physical space. And this is the point that I want to emphasize uh, today, the spaces of our homes and our cities. As with the arrival of mass media precisely in the early 20th century, which was also uh, encountered with a lot of resistance and surprise uh, by people uh, and by architects, uh, uh, likewise, social media today is redrawing once again what is public and what is private, uh, what is inside and what is outside. Design in the age of social media is not at all what just happened in the space of this little screen. Social media redesigns the spaces that we are living in. Now, early uh, 20th century architecture from this part of, of the world, uh, like out of laws, 
lamented uh, the effect that photography and the new illustrated journal uh, in architecture were having on architecture. Adolf Loos, for example, was extremely critical of his contemporary and ultra-rival uh, architect, Joseph Hoffman, because uh, according to Loos, his house appeared to be made uh, for the camera. They were uh, two-dimensional. They have lost any tectonic uh, qualities. It was difficult to tell them uh, apart um, from a cardboard uh, uh, model. And here are some pictures of Hoffman. Loos, on the other hand, was proud of the fact that his clients, according to him, could not recognize their own house, um, houses in photographies, which I think, of course, is, uh, is perhaps not totally uh, true. Perhaps they couldn't recognize uh, this uh, entrance to the Moller uh, house. Uh, but uh, Loos architecture, in fact, has a very abstract uh, photogenic, uh, in, in a way, quality. And as you will see, he adjusted uh, photographs, adding and removing elements, and even changing the view um, of the window, as he did, for example, with the publication of the Villa uh, Kuhner. Here you have the Villa Kuhner as he was published, and here you have the view out of the window before the publication. So he is actually clearly manipulating uh, the photograph and including another uh, picture that uh, looks to him more, more, uh, more interesting. And not only that, he also uh, places very carefully a car in front of the Villa Muller. I always thought this car must be the car of the owner, but I discovered this morning this is not the car of the owner. This must be a car that Loss uh, like because he didn't drive, so it's not his car either. So what is this car uh, doing here? It's very much like Le Corbusier, who always planted his uh, beautiful boisson in front of all his villas to demonstrate that the modernity of the uh, uh, house corresponded to the modernity of the car. In fact, it's kind of funny that you now look at these pictures and the car looks extremely ancient, where the house is actually pre pretty modern. Uh, or when he places this uh, cute kid in front of uh, another one of his houses, or, uh, or uh, uh, um, how do you call that, uh, uh, cello, no? inside the, uh, this glass. Uh, cabinet. In all the photographs, like in the Tristan uh, Thala house, for example, you have the feeling in Loos architecture they have been perfectly uh, staged. And besides, uh, architect, Loos is an architect that we know through the media precisely, through his writings, through his magazines. He published this, this magazine, uh, Das Andere, that by the way I just uh, did with uh, the publisher Lars Muller, a reprint of the, of the original magazine, uh, facsimile of the original magazine, uh, Das Andere, and uh, with the translation um, into, uh, into English. So Loos, at, on top of it, is an architect, as I say, that we know precisely through the media, through his writings, through the photographs of his buildings. Uh, it's very interesting, for example, when Vanham already wrote uh, in theories and, and design in the first machine age that when Loos arrived in Paris, he was known for his writings and not for his buildings that were only known through hearsay. Right? So that's very interesting. The writings arrived in Paris way before uh, uh, the buildings. Well, jumping to today, the interesting thing is that a new generation of architects is now being asked by their young clients uh, to design spaces that will look, book in, look good on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, etc. Even competitions like the uh, PS1 uh, pavilion uh, that MoMA organizes in, uh, in New York uh, every uh, year ask uh, or takes into consideration how Instagrammable uh, your uh, winning entry uh, will be. This is, I know, from a very good source of, uh, of an architect that won that competition. That, that was one of the questions. How Instagrammable your building uh, will be. And of course, any uh, building, this is uh, Andres Hake uh, Pavilion, uh, uh, of course. Um, uh, yes. And so, of course, any uh, building will be experienced uh, far, far more often in social media than in the streets. And the encounter in the streets, of course, 
is already shaped by social media in the same way that with photography also people could make that argument that peop many more people would have seen Villa Savoie, let's say, in photography that would have actually gone uh, down to Paris and then find uh, Villa Savoie or like me that went to see Villa Muller only uh, this morning when I have uh, written extensively about, about it and uh, know intimately uh, uh, the building. Um, while a generation ago, design uh, concerned itself with its reception in the printed press, in newspaper, in uh, in magazines, etc., etc., and they were extremely careful. Look at how these two have uh, placed themselves in the pace of this uh, of this magazine. No, uh, Miss and Johnson is very, very uh, uh, deliberate of how they photograph themselves in front of the building, or how they photograph their their architecture, uh, is spending a huge amount of money in extraordinary photographers that will take these, uh, these pictures that will uh, be uh, presented in this, uh, in this magazine. Well, now the concern is the reception in social media. How many tweets, how many likes, how many followers, how many reports. Uh, the ultimate uh, goal uh, is perhaps uh, the sign uh, going uh, viral. And let me go back to this one because it reminds me of what happened in the Biennale, I don't know, it was Biennale of Venice, perhaps 2000, 2010 for sure, the, Vienna, the Biennale of Sana, where uh, Rem Kurhas did a very beautiful uh, installation, but what I remember most about this installation is that at a certain point he had all these covers of magazines in America like Time or Fortune or Life and so on and so on. And the point was to demonstrate that, you know, it was a time in the 1950s, obviously, that architects were taken seriously and they were in the cover of these uh, magazines and now nobody cares about us and we were all, this is 2010 and we were all saying, oh yeah, poor architects, now, you know, nobody cares about us, etc., etc. But who will think that now? I mean, like, you know, these magazines are dying now, nobody's buying them or very few uh, people and uh, the most important thing is not uh, whether you are in the cover of time or in the cover of uh, fortune, but whether you uh, actually have a uh, a strong uh, reception uh, in social media. And this is important because um, museums and other cultural institutions, but also design and architectural offices have for a long time have uh, PR departments for following the lead of the American companies uh, that established PR departments in the post-war years. And by the way, this was this practice spread to, to Europe uh, when they open, uh, uh, start to open offices in, in, with the Marshall Plan also in Europe. How long it took for architects and designers to have PR firms I, is something that I'm very interested in. Salini was one of the first. But Philip Johnson claimed that it was uh, Bob uh, Venturi who, who was the first to have a PR uh, firm taking care of, uh, of his work. And he may have been right, but because how else to explain the success or the great expectation of this little uh, book, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, is nobody uh, knew him. Johnson said that every architect was kind of uh, angry about it, uh, but uh, or at least ironic about the fact that Venturi had a PR firm, but that he was himself the second. So Johnson, on the one hand, laughed about Venturi, and on the other hand, he was the second one to have a, a PR uh, uh, company. Well, the interesting thing is that in very recent years, a new position has emerged which is that of the, they call the social media coordinator or the curator or the curator of digital initiatives or the digital officer. And this is, many of them are coming from the business world. And it's not just museums and schools of architecture that have them, but even architectural offices feel the need to have a young person that takes care of all their uh, digital uh, representation. But again, to return to my issue, it's not uh, simply the expansion of reception that interests me here. The internet and social media are fundamentally redefining the spaces in which we live, our relationship to objects and to each other. Social media is, in my view, a new form of urbanization, the architecture of how we live uh, together. And this is important. We need to understand the world, the world, in, which, in, the world in which we live. You know? But architects and, and theorists may be the last to realize um, how architectural this transformation uh, has, has been. What are the consequences of this state of things? What is the architecture and urbanism 
of this uh, social media. I mean, we seem to be unable anymore to navigate uh, uh, the city without the help of our tablets or our telephones, right? I mean, we have lost our capacity even to, to read the uh, the signs in, in the street or to read a map. You see some people in the street looking at a map and it's like, a, you know, like they don't know. I mean, we have to go with Google Maps. Uh, so we navigate the, the city with the help of, of these uh, devices. But in any case, uh, I think this is an important issue, but the question is methodologically where to start investigating this massive uh, event. Already in the year 1999, before social media, therefore, an article in the New York Times reported that a quarter of a million people were exposing their lives online and that one million webcams had been sold only uh, that year. This was thought of as shocking uh, numbers. One million people were exposing themselves uh, online. Of course, today, billions are regularly exposing themselves online. The line precisely between what is private and what is uh, public, what is inside and what is outside has been radically uh, redrawn. Let's start then by asking the simple of all architectural questions. Where is all of this happening? What is the space of social media? And for this I found uh, in, in 2003 there was an Australian survey that found that 34% of social network users admitted to logging up on at work. So, 13 so of course, it's normal. No, you're at work, you're bored. So, 34% are online uh, on social media at work. 13% in a school. Well, the same. You're bored. You get uh, on social media. Except that there is more control, so less. 18% in their car, so that's starting to get a little bit dangerous. 44% in bed, 7% in the bathroom, and 6% in the toilet. Okay, this, you know what is most shocking to me about this, uh, this report and these statistics? What happened to the house, to the living room, or even to the bedroom? Social life takes place on the streets, or even in the living room, in the car, in the bathroom, or in the toilet, and above all, in the bed, floating as if it were uh, without bedroom or house or city. The, this bedroom has the bed has become the epicenter of the universe. Now, in what uh, probably now is a very conservative uh, estimate, I read uh, totally by chance in the Wall Street Journal uh, in the year 2000, 2012, sorry, that 80% of young professionals in New York were working regularly for bed. So I was totally astonished. 80% of young people are now working uh, uh, from bed. So the fantasy that we once have of the home office, and that they never were, of course, have given way to the bed office. The very meaning of the world office has uh, been transformed. Millions of dispersed uh, beds are taken over for concentrated office building. In a way, the boudoir is defeating uh, the, to the tower. Network electronic technologies, of course, have removed any limit to what can be done in bed. This actually 2012 is an, is an important year too because it's in the middle of the crisis still in the United States, right? With many people um, without work, without regular uh, work, and many offices, uh, office towers in in Manhattan, apparently half empty, despite the fact that they kept appearances in the lobby with all these people with their uniforms and their security, and you have to put the car here and that there. Right? But up there, it was an empty wall, and at the same time, you have millions of people dispersed through uh, all the neighborhoods of New York working uh, from their uh, beds in this kind of new economy of the, that is called the gig economy. No? Now, how did we get uh, there? And of course, since I am a kind of a historian, I went back historically and I was inspired actually by uh, um, Walter Benjamin, who wrote this beautiful essay, Louis Philippe or the Interior, where he writes precisely about the splitting of work and home in the 19th century. That was a shocking transformation as well, but in fact, uh, what I'm trying to say is that we are now living in 19th century uh, cities when in fact a new reality has now taken place. Anyway, Walter Benjamin, in this beautiful text, uh, writes that under Louis Philippe, the private citizen enters the stage of history. For the private person, living space becomes for the first time antithetical to the place of work. The former is constituted by the interior, and the office is its complement. 
From this springs the phantasmagorias of the interior. For the private individual, the private environment represents the universe. In it, he gathers remote places and the past. His living room is a box in the world uh, theater. Now, industrialization, uh, of course, brought with it the eight-hour uh, shift and the radical separation between the home and the office or the factory, between rest and work, between night and day. Post-industrialization is collapsing work back into the home and taking it further into the bedroom and into the bed itself. Phantasmagorias are no longer lining the walls uh, in the wallpaper, the fabrics, the images, and the objects. It is now in the electronic devices. The whole universe is concentrated in this small screen with the bed floating in an infinite sea of information. To lie down is now not to rest, but to move. The bed is now a site of action. And you see, this is actually an advertisement uh, collaborating in bed from the company Blue Beam. And it's really fascinating to me that collaborating bed is being represented by a woman with her legs up and again uh, lying, working um, in bed. The bed um, is now uh, a site of, of work, a site of action. And the uh, occupant is kind of a voluntary uh, invalid uh, that has no need uh, for uh, her legs. The legs are up, right? The bed, in, a, in that sense, has become the ultimate uh, prosthetic, and a whole new industry is now devoted to providing contraptions to facilitate work while you lie down, reading, writing, texting, recording, broadcasting, listening, talking, and of course, eating, drinking, sleeping, or making love, activities that seem to have been turned of late into work itself. Waiters, waiters in restaurants in the United States ask you if you are still working on that, like if eating was, was work. No, I'm not working on that before they remove your, your play. And endless advice is, um, is constantly dispensed about how to work on your personal relationships, how you actually should schedule uh, sex with your partner, because apparently otherwise it doesn't uh, happen. Sleeping is definitely a hard work too for millions with the psychopharmaceutical uh, industry providing new drugs every year and an army of sleep experts providing advice on how to achieve this apparently ever more elusive goal. Of course, all in the name of uh, higher uh, productivity. Everything done in bed, you can say, uh, has become work. This philosophy actually was already in, uh, kind of embodied in the figure of Hugh Hefner, uh, the famous uh, editor of uh, Playboy uh, magazine, who died uh, recently, who also famously almost never left uh, his bed, let alone his home. He lit literally moved his office to his bed in 1960, when he moved into the Playboy uh, mansion in Chicago, turning into the epicenter of a global empire, and his silk uh, pajamas and his dressing gown into a new kind of business attire. I don't go out of the house at all. I am a contemporary recluse, he told Tom Wolfe, who had come to interview him, and of course he interviews him uh, in bed. He said he guessed at that time that the last time he had been out of the house was three and a half months before, and that in the last two years, maybe he had been out of the house maximum nine times. Fascinated, Tom Wolfe uh, called him or described him as the tender timpani heart of an artichoke. Even when Hefner was out, he was not out at all. Uh, he was wrapped in a succession of uh, bubbles, all designed to expand the interior. This included all the uh, outfitted, especially outfitted uh, vehicles, of which the most interesting one is perhaps the big uh, bunny. Uh, which is a, a, a DC-9 uh, that was designed, the interior designed by Ron Tiersmith, the same architect that have done the mansion. And that included a gourmet kitchen, a dancing floor, a living room, conference space, discotheque, a wet bar, a state-of-the-art cinemascope uh, uh, projectors, a sleeping quarters uh, for 16 guests, and of course, Hefner suite uh, with a sour and an elliptic uh, uh, bed covered in Tasmanian opossum skins. This is uh, Hefner actually arriving in Heathrow uh, Airport with his then 
friend Barbie, and you can see that she's totally at ease, right? And he's a little bit more tense, like, okay, this is a bed, and it's kind of round, but it's not my bed, my normal bed, so it's a bit, so it's like he's agoraphobic, right? He says, like, the idea of going out. And in many ways, it's kind of this uh, kind of paranoia of not, never going out, and when you go out, you go from one interior to another, in so many ways, and anticipates the reality of our times uh, today. Of course, uh, when he went out, also he was going into Playboy uh, uh, clubs, uh, so another uh, interior, starting with the Playboy club in Chicago in 1960. You can see the architect, so it's always very interesting in, uh, in Playboy, and rapidly uh, growing from seven play uh, Playboy clubs in 63 to about 17 in 65, and ultimately th um, 33 all around. Uh, the world in Miami, in New Orleans, and here you have Hefner, uh, actually with the maquette of the club and hotel that was supposed to be uh, in Los Angeles and was uh, actually never realized. But what fascinates me about this uh, photograph is the fact that Hefner is, uh, thinks of himself, not only he's super interested in modern architecture, but thinks of himself as an architect. Look at the way in which he's pointing with the pipe to, to the model very much in the same way that Le Corbusier would have done with <laughs> Villa Savoie, or here is uh, Miss with his model, or is Sararin in a gig, so all the tropes of modern architect, the architect with their model and their pipe. So he thinks of himself really as an architect, and not only that, he was super fascinated in architecture. This I'm going totally off the, off the uh, record uh, here, but just to give you a sense, uh, not only he published from the beginning of, uh, of Playboy, which is 1953, uh, the best uh, architects that were actually not very well considered in the United States, like uh, Miss, for example, at that time, all the shelter magazines like House and Garden and all of this, they call him the threat to the new America, these communist architects. Of course, there is nothing communist about, about Miss, but that tells you about the paranoia in the United States, about all these foreigners that are coming and are taking over our, our country and are bringing up this modern architecture that is horrible, right? So um, uh, this is what is happening in most, in most uh, magazines, but Playboy embraced uh, modern architecture. First, it starts to publish people like Franjo Wright or Miss Van der Rohe. Of course, Playboy was based in Chicago, so they look first for what is close at hand. But before we know, they are publishing all the great designers of the of the 1950s, like the Imps or Saarinen or Noise, etc. They are all uh, they are they are all uh, asked at a certain point to come to New York. Actually, I found this when I was working on on the Imps. And you know when you are in an archive and you're starting to get, you have been there the whole day, and eh, this document and the other one, and you're kind of getting bored and a little bit. Eh? And, and then all of a sudden I see a, a file, a folder that says Playboy. I say, oh my God. Playboy. So I take the, you know, this is 1994, and I take the the folder of Playboy, and there is a letter from Playboy asking uh, Charles Eames if he will come uh, to New York for a photo uh, shoot. And I thought to myself, okay, these people are now very busy. All of them are very busy, and they are all asked to come to New York for a photo shoot. And they uh, don't ask, you know, uh, why will I do that? Why will I stop working? Um, uh, how much are you paying? Nothing, nothing of that. You know what they ask? What do I wear? <laughs> <laughs> what do I wear? So they are, they are all in their best uh, uh, outfit. Of course, uh, uh, the Sarini chair, for example, is an iconic uh, uh, chair where all the pinups appear, and, and as well the, as the Hardoy uh, chair. Anything that was happening in the architectural world, and particularly in the avant-garde architectural world, for example, the new landscape exhibition with all these great uh, uh, designers like Roberto Mata, uh, um, uh, the father, by the way, of uh, 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 Gordon Mata Clark, uh, and his Malite chair. This is actually only two weeks after the Museum of Modern Art uh, opened its famous domestic landscape uh, exhibition where all these uh, great uh, Italian designers uh, were presented and it was very successful, but success in the, in the, in the moment will be like maybe 300,000 people went to see it. Playboy published it and of course seven million copies get around the United States. So all of a sudden, all, all the United States knows very much about Joe Colombo, or Tobias Scarpa, or Malite Chair, or the Archizum, Miss Chair, etc., etc. So much so that a whole generation start buying Sarinen chairs 
and they um, uh, it's because Playboy told them. I once was in giving a lecture in um, Cornell University years ago, and I made a joke about how you know there were all these. And then at the end of the of the lecture, this woman comes to me. She says, "Now I understand why my father had this amazing collection of uh, 1950s uh, sarin and anims and noise. And you know, my father uh, never went to the university, never set foot in any museum, does have not the least idea about the science. So I ask him, why, where do you get these incredible chairs? Because now she was, of course, an architecture student, so she knew a lot." about that, she says, Playboy told me to get them. So <laughs> Playboy uh, had a guide at the end, and he said, you know, for Christmas, buy this, buy that. And most of it, actually, is quite interesting, because you have done quite well. For example, when the first cardboard um, chair of Frank Gehry was being sold by Bloomingdale's in the 70s, in the early 70s, uh, for $37. Playboy recommended their readers to go and buy one. Now, you have done very well if you had bought that chair, which is now thousands of dollars, and the same with many of these uh, pieces. But I should return to the bed, which is uh, where I was, because actually Playboy turned the bed actually into a workplace. From the mid-50s uh, on, the bed becomes increasingly sophisticated, outfitted with all kinds of sorts of entertainment and communication devices as a kind of control room. The bed was introduced as a feature, and here he is in his own bed, always working in bed. He never uh, stopped uh, doing that. The bed was uh, actually introduced first in a feature called Playboy Townhouse uh, in, in 1962 in Playboy, which is actually an unrealized unre uh, project that was commissioned to be Hefner's uh, own house. It's very much like a Paul Rudolph uh, uh, house. And it's very interesting that this is the first time that this uh, round bed was uh, introduced. In the end, the house didn't pass the landmark commission in Chicago because it was it's in a very fancy uh, neighborhood. And, uh, and it was not realized. But the one piece, and perhaps it's not by chance that was realized, was the um, round bed that was installed in the mansion. The bed itself, you can argue, is a house. Its rotating and vibrating uh, structure was packed with a small fridge, hi-fi, telephone, filing cabinets, bar, microphone, dictaphone, video cameras, headphones, TV, breakfast tables, work surfaces, and control for all the light fixtures, fixtures in the house. You could control everything from the entrance to all the lights in the house from uh, the bed, of course, all for the man that doesn't want to leave. The bed was uh, Hefner's office, his place of business, as you can see, where he conducted interviews, made telephone calls, selected images, adjusted layouts, edited text, ate, drank, and consulted with playmates. I have no evidence, actually, that he have any, ever had sex with any of these playmates, but <laughs> that he worked in bed, that I know for sure. But Hefner actually was not uh, alone. The bed may have been the ultimate uh, American office at mid-century. In an interview in Paris Review in 1957, Truman Capote is asked, what are some of your writing habits? Do you use a desk? Do you write on a typewriter machine? To which he answers, I am a completely horizontal author. I can only think I'm, if I am lying down, either in bed or stretched on a couch and with a cigarette uh, and a coffee uh, handy. But, you know, and then he goes on about how uh, he, um, uh, as the day passes, he changes the drink from tea or from coffee. He starts drinking in the, in the early afternoon, and then the, the journalist asks him, but do you, don't you type at a certain point? No, 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 I write in longhand, and just at a certain point I type, and then do you get up for typing? No, no, I put it in my knees, and it goes quite well. I can do it uh, quite fast, etc., etc. So he ne from morning to evening, he doesn't leave... Uh, uh, the bed, he does all the work uh, in the bed. But you've been, it has more surprise to know that even architects set up office in bed at mid century. Richard Neutra, for example, started working, they're not only there are beds everywhere in the house, but he started working uh, from the moment he woke up with elaborate equipment that enabled him to design, write, or even interview in bed. According to his son, Dion Neutra, in a letter, he says, Dad's first 
time for creative thinking was early in the morning, long before any activity had started in the office below. He often stayed in bed working with ideas and designs, even extending into appointments. Uh, his one concession uh, was to put on a tie over his night shirt when receiving visitors were still prop in bed. So he's having interviews in bed with his pyjamas, and the only concession he makes is to put a tie on top of his pyjamas. Right? But he still stays in bed. Neutra's uh, bed in, um, uh, in his BDL uh, house in Silver Lake, Los Angeles, included, it's very difficult to find f f f uh, photographs of this bed. The only one I found is this one. But from the letters to his sister and, to, and from his son, I learned that the bed included two public phones, three communication stations for talking with other rooms in the house, the office below, and even another office 500 meters away. So there are cables going down the, the street. Three different call bells, drafting boards, and easels that folded down over the bed, electric lights, and a radio gramophone control from the dashboard uh, above. You can see that. A bedside table had the tape recorder, the electric clock, and a storage compartment for drawings and writing equipment so that the, he could, as Neutra put it in a letter to his sister, use every minute from morning to late night. That's what he says in a letter to his sister, describing precisely the setup of this uh, bedroom in which he doesn't need to move at all. Post-war uh, uh, America inaugurated, in that sense, the high-performance bed as the epicenter of productivity. A new form of industrialization that was exported globally has now become available uh, to an international army of dispersed but interconnected uh, producers. A new kind of factory without walls is constructed uh, by compact electronics and extra pillars for the 24-7 generation. The kind of equipment uh, that Hefner uh, envisioned, some of which, like the answering machine, didn't even exist, he invented it by uh, connecting a tape recorder to the telephone so that the tape recorder could take the calls that were coming from the girl of the night before where he was having a, a, a story with another uh, uh, girl. Um, uh, he is now, of course, expanded for the internet, internet and social media generation who not only work in bed, but socialize in bed, exercise in bed, read the news in bed, and entertain sexual relationships with people miles away uh, from their bed. The playboy uh, fantasy of the nice girl uh, next door is more likely realized today with someone in another continent than in, an, in the same building or even in the same uh, neighborhood. A person you may never have seen before and you may never see again, and it's anybody's guess whether she is real or he is real as if existing in, in some uh, place and time or is an electronic uh, construction. As with the uh, relatively recent film, uh, Her, which if you haven't seen, you should uh, 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 see, it's fantastic. It's a moving depiction of life in the soft uh, uterine uh, a state that is the corollary to our new mobile uh, technologies, the heart in question is actually an operating system that turns out to be much more satisfying than a partner, uh, a partner than a person. The protagonist lies in bed, uh, chanting with heart, arguing, making love, and eventually breaking up still in bed. If according uh, to Jonathan Clary, uh, let, late in his beautiful book 24-7, uh, late uh, capitalism is the end of sleep, colonizing every minute of our lives for production and consumption, then the actions of this voluntary uh, recluse are not so voluntary in the end. But where um, I have two problems actually with 24-7. One is that he, the cover is very beautiful, but it somehow is an old idea of the city. It seems like, I, again, the idea of the city that never sleeps, the kind of office tower uh, constantly occupied, when in fact we may live in another uh, reality. Then is that he connects this uh, idea of sleep only to capitalism, but in fact I find it fascinating that communism had its own ideas uh, about bringing the bed to the workplace. In fact, before uh, uh, all of this that I have presented here, here is uh, actually Menikov in kind of a, a state of exhaustion. But in 1929, nine, at the height of Stalin's uh, first year five plan, with the working day extended and mass exhaustion of factory workers in the face of staggering uh, production quotas, 
uh, the Soviet government organized a competition for a new city of rest for 100,000 workers. And Konstantin uh, Menlikov, who in these pictures look extremely sleep uh, deprived himself, presented uh, the Sonata of Sleep, a new building type uh, for collective uh, sleep with synchronized and mechanized uh, uh, beds rocking the workers to unconsciousness, unconsciousness and slanted floors to eliminate the need for pillows. Centralized uh, control booths with the sleep attendants will regulate temperature, humidity, smells, and even sounds to maximize sleep. Among the uh, sounds that, uh, that he mentions include the rustles of leaves, the cooing of nightingales, and the soft murmur of waves. That's what he mainly describes in this project that he calls laboratory of uh, sleep. He even make a made a poster, Melnikov, that says, cure through sleep and thereby alter the character and anyway thinking otherwise is sick. Okay. So the inspiration of uh, Mendikov was apparently American. Uh, Mendikov had read about a military academy in Florida who was teaching language to sleeping uh, uh, cadets. Sleep itself had become part of the industrial process. The 19th, the 19th century division of the city that we have been talking about, the city uh, between the city of rest and the city of war, may soon itself become obsolete. Not only are our habits and habitats changed with the internet and social media, but predictions about the end of human labor in the wake of new technologies and robotization that they were already made, actually, by the way, in the at the end of the 19th century, are no longer treated as uh, futuristic. Here is um, uh, Vasily Leontief, who 35 years ago, uh, this economist, uh, argued that they replaced uh, horses, didn't they? didn't they? He says, and then he continues, that the human worker will go the way to the horse, uh, or the way of the horse, and nobody pay any attention to him. Like, he's a crazy uh, man, no? Despite the fact that he got the Nobel Prize and was professor at Harvard, he was treated, his predictions were treated like, okay, this is crazy, right? But recently, in the business section of the New York Times, uh, they reconsider uh, this idea. It's being taken seriously by a lot of people, and they wrote, Horses hung around in the labor force for quite some time after they were first challenged by modern communication technologies, like the telegraph and the railroad, hauling staff and people around farms and cities. But with the internal combustion engine came along as, as a critical component of the world economy were history. Humans as war horses might, as we, might also be on the way out. So we may out be also the way of the horse. The horse was made redundant, and it was actually a serious problem what to do with all these horses, that obviously there was no longer work for them, and they were like an uh, in enormous amount uh, uh, of uh, pasting in, in uh, so humans uh, likewise have, uh, 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 are closer uh, to this problem. Economists, of course, wonder what time of economic model this reality will lead to, from growing inequalities with vast amount of people unemployed to large redistributions in the form of uh, what they call the universal basic income, which was recently, as you know, considered, well, maybe recently, it's not so recently, maybe two years ago, uh, considered in a referendum in Switzerland and rejected. But the fact that it was posed in a referendum to the whole country of Switzerland already tells you something. And now there are multiple, as you may know, trials all over the place, underway from California to Finland, where they give uh, uh, small, relatively small communities, but, uh, maybe $2,000 uh, a person a month uh, to see for an extended period of time to see what happens when people don't need to work for money, because nobody knows what, uh, what does this mean when massive amounts of people uh, will not uh, uh, have work. Uh, the end of paid labor and its replacement with creative uh, leisure was already actually envisioned in utopian projects of the 1960s and 70s by Constant, by Superstudio and Archithum. And, Archithum. and actually, by the way, they always somehow include hyper-equipped uh, beds like these ones of, uh, of Archigram. So this is what is, I found strange that in the 60s and 70s, architects were thinking about this, were experimenting with this, were anticipating this new reality. And now that it's really upon us, we don't seem to be thinking about it. We have become like a 
deers in the in the in the headlight. This experimental architects devoted themselves to the equipment of the new mobile nomad with a whole galaxy of lightweight portable uh, interiors with soft uh, reclining spaces uh, as the ones of, that you can see here of Mike Webb, the Cusicol, uh, and the Suite Alone, right? And here is again uh, uh, Archigram. Uh, a kind of, uh, uh, all this can be understood and particularly the ones that we saw before with this, uh, all this uh, uh, Warren Shock with all the bathematic, with all these uh, these uh, effects, eh? plug in bathematic, spraying, extend, steam, exotic, up, down, all around, dry power stimulation, wash, and float in. So they are high performance beds with uh, complete with media, artificial atmosphere, color, light, and smell in a kind of psycho or po pop psychedelic uh, Menlikov, with the worker now sleeping in the control booth. Rainer Banhan, you may uh, 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 know of him, of course, in another cont contest. He wrote about a naked uh, Jane Fonda flying through a sp a space in her far uh, line horizontal bubble in the same way that he actually enthusiastically embraced the architecture of Playboy. And this, he does it in this very stiff magazine, the architectural journal that I put there so that you can see how crazy it is that he will publish this article there I will crawl a mile for Playboy, and he says, of course uh, I buy for the giant fold that full up color pinups. Playboy's placemates are America's greatest gift to Western culture, and you know how I go for culture. But if I was a working hypocrite, I would find a dozen other reasons for keeping abreast of Playboy. Item, architecture, and interior design. I would repeat, repeat that's to show that I'm not kidding. Architecture and interior design. Raina Banhan, I will crawl a mile for Playboy in the Architects Journal in 1960, which means that he knew that he had paid attention to the fact that there was a lot, a lot of architecture in Playboy uh, uh, magazine. It was a matter of time uh, <laughs> before John uh, Lennon and Yoko Ono had a week uh, uh, weekend, uh, week long, sorry, bed in peace, uh, bed in for peace in the Amsterdam Hilton uh, Hotel during their honeymoon in March of 1969. The idea of bed in uh, actually comes from sit in uh, protest and was intended as a non violent protest against war, against the Vietnam War, and to promote world peace. Make love, not war, uh, was of course the slogan of the day. But to the disappointment of uh, journalists, John and Yoko uh, were fully dressed in their pyjamas, sitting in bed, as John put it, like angels. The bed had taken over uh, from the street as a site of protest. They invited uh, the whole uh, uh, press into their room every day between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., treating the bed as a wall space, as a work space with journalists streaming and images streaming out. Meanwhile, uh, returning to our times, uh, the city has started to redesign itself. In today's attention uh, deficit disorder, we have discovered that we were better in short bursts, uh, punctuated by the rest. I consider this like the revenge of the Spanish siesta. They have always said that the Spanish people are uh, lazy and that's why we take siestas. And now it turns out to be that actually it makes a lot of sense from the point of view of productivity. So now m many offices have these uh, metro apps and different companies have this uh, kind of cabins that are very much inspired by the 1960s uh, 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 idea. Uh, by the basic that, pro that actually, according to many studies, maximize uh, productivity. Bed and office are never very far apart in this 24 7 world that we inhabit. A special self enclosed uh, beds have been designed for office space, turning themselves into kind of compact CL capsules, mini space, mini space shifts that can be used in isolation or uh, gather uh, together, like uh, in this airport. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, not actually for the claustrophobic. I would die before I put myself in one of these coffins, but apparently people use them <laughs> all the time. And they also use them in offices. And there are offices that they have entire rooms where people kind of get inside one of these uh, 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 capsules. But the important thing 
is that uh, sleep has become a part of work rather than the opposite. So, to conclude, between the bed inserted in the office and the office inserted in the bed, a whole new kind of horizontal uh, architecture has taken over that is magnified by the flat networks of social media that have themselves been fully integrated into the professional business and industrial environment in a collapse of traditional distinctions between private and public work and play, rest and action. The bed itself, which is a more sophisticated mattress, linings, and technical attachment, is the basis of an intrauterine environment that combines the sense of deep interiority with a sense of inter hyperconnectivity uh, with the uh, outside. But what we may ask is the nature of this in new interior in which we have uh, decided collectively to check ourselves in. What is the architecture of this prison in which night and day, work and play, are no longer differentiated and we are permanently un under surveillance? New uh, media, in a way, turn us, all of us into inmates, into prisoners, constantly under surveillance, even as we celebrate uh, endless connectivity. We have all become a contemporary recluse, as Hugh Ferner put it a half a century ago. In Laura uh, Poitras' uh, film, uh, Citizen Four, uh, you see uh, Edward Snowden close up sitting on his bed in a Hong Kong uh, hotel for days on end surrounded by his laptop communicating with journalists that are in the room but also all around the world about the secret world of massive uh, global surveillance. The biggest invasion of privacy in the history of the planet is revealed from a bed and it dominates all media. The most uh, public figure in the world at that moment is a recluse in that sense architecture has been inver inver inverted. Thank you very much. So uh, I thank you very much, Beatrice, for your exciting lecture. Uh, it's time for questions. Um, I'm not sure whether we can uh, use the microphone in another place or only here. You know, so everybody must come here. You can. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> Um, you can ask uh, English, but uh, you can ask also Czech, but uh, who will have Czech question, please wait a minute before, because I have the, the headphones for, for Beatrice. So maybe the first, uh, Dr. Andial. Before he comes, I have one question. Yes. Uh, to, okay. the, to that uh, photo of Hefner bed. Did you also sleep there? Yes, of course. He, <laughs> because he, it was full of objects, I yes, can, and can't he, imagine. He sleeps, he eats. Did you see all these candy bars that he has around it? I mean, he's like a, like a kid. He are, uh, they are only these candy bars and Coca-Cola and all these uh, uh, basically uh, terrible things for you, but he obviously lo loves it. Uh, I mean, here he is, so, uh, but if you pay attention, there are uh, like candy bars and, and uh, candy apples and let me see if another picture you see better. Uh, okay, now I'm doing the whole uh, lecture again. <laughs> but backwards. It's okay, I believe it. I believe it. No, 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 but it's not uh, only working, but you see the, the whatever it's called, Baby Ruth, I don't know what this, this crap is, but it's all uh, Pepsi-Cola, no Coca-Cola, I mean, like, <laughs> and, and there are two, free, two three fridges in that uh, bed. He doesn't move, he doesn't move at all. So in many ways, it's, uh, it's because I'm a voluntary recluse. So it's a voluntary recluse of uh, architecture. I wonder whether actually Ren Kuh has uh, took this voluntary recluse for his voluntary prisoners of architecture. Because definitely he does know a lot about Playboy, but anyway, that's another story. Yes. Um, your your closing was a little bit surprising because it came all of a, all of a sudden about surveillance and all that. Yes. And so I I would like to connect it to another theme or question you raised, and which was why in the 60s all these architects were thinking about something which we are now approaching very fast and we don't think so much. I think there might be some connection between the two. Yes, I 
don't know whether there is a connection, but the question of uh, social media cannot be separated from the question of uh, surveillance. Uh, you may think, and I myself uh, many times have thought so, that it's so great that one can now work in bed and you know you are there and you are connecting and ah. Uh, but uh, I mean, I should have post a posted here because I always have a posted in for this camera because you know even when the this screen is black, they are watching you. Right? So you are constantly under surveillance, and even if you are not under surveillance in that sense, uh, and you know very well what it is to be under surveillance, so certain generation here knows very well what it is about surveillance, as I know, because I also live under a dictatorship in Franco uh, times, that didn't, Franco didn't die until, until, uh, until 76. Actually, I was in Praga when Franco uh, died. So I have great, very good uh, memories of Praga because <laughs> I was very happy. And all the students of the architects of Barcelona, we were celebrating the street like crazy. Probably people were thinking, well, what's wrong with these people? But uh, 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 you know you know what it is to be under surveillance. But the, you, even when you think that you are not working, ah, you are here booking a trip to the Caribbean, maybe. Eh? But you are producing data. You are being uh, actually exploited in, in so many ways. Your data is being tracked. So in, in constantly you are being under surveillance. So it's not, uh, I don't know where he went, your question. Yes, it's not surprising then to me. Maybe I was going too fast and I didn't emphasize so much the question of, uh, of surveillance. But surveillance is very much part both of the world of Hefner, who had a big file. Uh, with the CIA and the FBI, they were completely on top of him because he was, uh, you know, in many ways you can say, oh, yeah, well, you know, this is uh, terrible. But on the other hand, he was uh, progressive. I mean, he was, um, uh, his uh, clubs admitted uh, uh, African-American uh, musicians and African-American clients way before any other client. Uh, he was in favor of, uh, of uh, uh, reproduction uh, rights uh, for, uh, for women, in favor of abortion against capital uh, uh, punishment. He interviewed in Playboy magazine people like Martin Luther King, like uh, Fidel Castro, like uh, Malcolm X. So in many ways, he was uh, progressive. And that's why he got a huge file in, uh, in, um, in, 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 with the FBI. He, they were really after him. But today, we cannot separate social media from the question of, uh, of surveillance. Many people actually have, uh, when realizing the extent of the way in which our data is being used, remove themselves from uh, Facebook and from other uh, sites. Uh, I myself have never been in Facebook and don't want to be in, in, fa in Facebook. It scares me. Like the loss of, of, the, of privacy to such an extent, to the, the way in which. But it's inevitable that, uh, my, that my telephone knows that I am here, uh, that my computer knows that I am here, that probably some pictures are even uh, possibly uh, taken and that every uh, uh, move I make, uh, whether it's to take an Uber car or uh, book a trip to uh, somewhere else, I mean, it's producing data. So you are constantly under surveillance and producing uh, data. So in many ways, we are working for the man, uh, still, to use that uh, famous sentence, working for <coughs> the man. I, I know that in the USA, it is especially uh, many times the issue of the, the debate, not so much in our, in our country, I think, till mm -hmm. now. The problem of surveillance, because we are used to it, we think it's, it's okay because it brings safety to our streets, and, <clears throat> and we don't think that we have it changed the safety for freedom. Uh -huh. So you don't think so much about surveillance? That's I, uh, I, I, I have read a, very much about it in, in your journals and uh, uh -huh. in, in, in the USA, but not so much in, our, in this country. No. I, I no, don't think people feel it as a program till now. Right. It's something which brings positive things, say the safety on the street. Yeah. Well, you know, but, uh, it comes at a price. I, I prefer freedom with a little bit of danger. You prefer? Why not? I prefer freedom so with, with a little, with little bit of uh, danger. <laughs> yes. So, uh, next, next question, please. Tell me what asking about. No, no, no. To je kvůli záznamu, víte? But they are recording or something, so... You are under surveillance, too. They are being recorded. To, uh, hello, nice to meet Hi. you. Uh, I didn't want you to ask about surveillance so much, but I would like you to ask you about Pinterest and every stuff like the Tumblr and Facebook, that they are showing us 
some aesthetic over the architecture. Mm. And they were showing us what's beautiful and what's uh, aesthetically like good. But at some point, I would like to ask you if uh, there is maybe connection to show us that we need to build new stuff because I right now don't think so that it's uh, really good, to, not to good, but it's not important so much to build new stuff. Uh, and especially in the Western countries, they are showing us to build and build and build more and more stuff and making us so much closing in the buildings and mm -hmm. um, making virtual reality and everything that we are going to be in totally different place. Mm -hmm. And they are not showing us design that it's, I think, much uh, better ecologically and much better showing us what's uh, maybe the future and uh, not uh, exploring the nature. So I would like to ask you if uh, there is maybe the same connection in Facebook and everything that is like building our own walls between five or six or even in a bed mm -hmm. and then we don't have a space for us to enjoy the nature and everything because right now I see in the future that maybe me, like maybe a future architect if I finish graduation, uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to be totally uh, on some way that maybe the future medias are showing us yes. and not myself thinking. So I would like to ask you if there is possible way that it's going to go this way or we have still opportunity to do this kind of the stuff. Yeah, of, of course you have always opportunity, but that's, that's uh, actually when you say they, they are not showing us, they are not doing this. I wonder who is they, because actually what, uh, what I suppose is different from the earlier period is that uh, unlike, uh, uh, let's say, with the printed press that is still dominated by, let's say, professional photographers and professional journalists, everybody now thinks he's an editor, everybody thinks he's an artist, everybody is using uh, this media to um, uh, uh, present and represent uh, uh, themselves. So it is obviously in our hands uh, uh, to a certain extent the message that, that we send. There is not a day communicating to, um, to us what to do or not to do, but more of, of an us, right? Uh, I will say um, in architecture, we need, if anything, uh, to do what the generation of the uh, modern architects uh, did, which is precisely uh, uh, embrace the new med media and use it for their own uh, purposes. I mean, uh, uh, modern architects were extremely uh, skillful in uh, even people like Adolf Loos that complains about the media and that uh, his friends or his enemy houses are designed for the media. He himself is very carefully uh, uh, presenting uh, his arguments in both polemical, satirical, extraordinarily uh, beautiful uh, texts that will get him all over uh, the world communicating his message about architecture. What is he doing? He's using the, the power of, uh, of the printed press, which is relatively uh, recent, to uh, uh, have an influence that will precede uh, his buildings. In that sense, it's fascinating the uh, quote of uh, Van Han when he says that when laws arrived in Paris, he was known through his writings and not through his buildings. So he is an architect, like all of them, like the Corbusier, nobody knew him until he started writing, like Frangio Wright, like all of them. You can say that the 20th century architects that didn't write are practically unknown. The ones that we know better from the beginning of the century are Frangio Wright, Adolf Loos, Le Corbusier, uh, 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 Gropius, etc., etc. Even Mies, that uh, he said almost nothing, actually a whole book at a certain point was put together with all his writing, so he had written quite a bit, right? And then you go through the 20th, through the mid-century with, um, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi. How did they become known? They became known through complexity and contradiction, and then we start paying attention uh, to uh, the architecture, right? The, likewise with Rem Kuhas, Delirious New York, written many years before, he will actually be able to build a building that will start looking, okay, maybe this is not that bad. So he made a name for himself using precisely uh, the media, uh, publications in which he published his projects, his project as a student, right? Uh, at the AA, is published way before he is able to build anything. All the architecture of the 20th century is the architecture, this is the argument on, on privacy and publicity, the architects of this media. I don't think uh, 
Right now, we are uh, maybe there are a few examples that I can think of that are using very intelligently uh, new media and social media. But for the most part, we are not uh, uh, still understanding uh, uh, how to operate in this. Uh, in this, with all its, its problems, with all its complexity, with all its uh, contradictions, with all the things that are negative that we have uh, mentioned uh, before, we can uh, definitely use it in a more. I'm an optimist. That's probably... <laughs> Sorry, can I have one more question? Yes. Because it's quite interesting to see... Please, wait, wait, wait. Translate, we'll not hear you. Right now, especially, we... It's not like, I think, in 20th century that we have much more uh, freedom in showing something. Like, I see Bjarke Lens on the Instagram. He's showing interesting photos, and it's quite interesting. And he's expanding his architecture, but he's not showing just the architecture. But then you have a Shigeru Ban who won a Pritzker Prize, and he's helping totally different side. And nobody, I think, right now, hear nothing from just maybe f people from the school of architecture see something. But uh, I think maybe even if he try, uh, there is going to be somehow canceling. Even when you have Instagram and you're showing something provocative, you still think that it's going to be possible and Instagram is not going to ban the work that you are doing. So do you think it's still we have the same freedom like people in 60s and 70s when there wasn't social media at this point? More freedom. More freedom in the sense that before you depended on, an, on a magazine, you depended on an editor that decided that you were worth the time, that they would publish you, right? Adolf Loh, for example, complained constantly about the fact that uh, his architecture was not photogenic. And that's why architectural ma ma magazines were uh, passing him over in favor of uh, people like, like, uh, like Hoffman that were uh, photogenic. But this is not really uh, clear, because when you look at the way in which he eventually starts using the media, he's very skillful, so much more skillful than Hoffman that actually now is much better known. Uh, historically. Uh, uh, so many architects with a different kind of uh, methods could uh, uh, find ways of using uh, uh, media to communicate their new media to communicate their message. I suppose it's more uh, the positive side of it is that uh, it's more horizontal that you can you can do it uh, I can do it, uh, uh, Peter can do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, maybe, maybe the last question, if, if there is something. So, uh, I, I will thank you once again. Uh, Beatrice and Mark, where is he? Oh, he yeah. <laughs> they have promised to come again because they were in Prague only two days, so I hope that we will have another chance to listen to their lectures. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.